disruption of our homes ending the housing crisis. I'm Ryan Catalani, and I'll be your host today. Our guest is Paul Williams, a fellow in the Guaranteed Income Policy area at the Jane Family Institute. He's currently pursuing his master's degree in economics at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice at the City University of New York. He formerly worked at the Chicago Department of Housing and the Economic Opportunity Institute in Washington State. Paul, welcome and, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Ryan. I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'm excited to talk about my favorite topic, social housing, and uh, give some examples on financing and operations uh, from around the world and some considerations for scaling these programs up in the United States. Excellent. Uh, well, I understand you have a presentation, so I'll let you get that pulled up. And in the meantime, I'll just let our attendees know that um, we do hope to take your, your audience questions if you have any. So feel free to just put them in the chat or the Q&A function, whatever is easiest, and we'll try to address as many as we can uh, by the end of the session. All right, can everyone see that? Looks good. Okay. So I am just gonna go ahead and jump right in. I think this presentation will probably be around um, 25, 30 minutes. Um, and then we can go into q and I you know, wanna leave it for a lot of Q&A. There's you know, a lot of information in here um, and I'm assuming folks will have some questions about some of these examples. So when folks are interested in scaling up social housing, um, I like to you know, break things down into the really big picture questions uh, for getting the nuts and bolts right. So the first one is, what is it exactly that we are asking a public agency to do? And so the, the real big picture top line is we want a public sector agency to address the supply needs for the housing market by building housing. Um, and so you want a public sector agency to do something like this. What authorities do you need to endow an agency to be able to accomplish that task? Um, first one that is, is you're gonna need in most any cases, some kind of bonding authority or ability to borrow dollars, whether that's you know, and we'll get into a few of those different financial models, whether that's from uh, a, a public loan fund of some kind or whether that's allocations uh, that are then bonded out. Um, you need some ability for an agency to deal with those financials. Um, acquisition is a big one that does not come naturally to agencies. Uh, in most states and jurisdictions, you're gonna need to give, uh, give an agency the ability to acquire land. You need to buy property, uh, assemble it, um, you know, do different planning tasks, integrate uh, with, with existing infrastructure, sewers, transit, all these different things. And then the third really big one is contracting. Um, finding uh, general contractors, uh, designers, folks who are going to be designing and actually doing the construction work um, on on social housing properties. Um, this is one that gets, uh, you know, for a lot of agencies can be kind of tricky. Uh, for example, you know, the more traditional public housing agencies in the United States um, have very strong restrictions on the type of contracting uh, and bids that they're able to do and a lot of rules around them that, you know, can extend the timeline of projects, you know, multiple years um, that just, it just slows down the process a lot of times and finding ways to do a contracting process that can help you meet that need quickly is, is an important piece of the social housing approach. And then of course, what resources do you need to endow a public agency with? Well, they're going to need staff. Um, they're going to need financing of some kind. Uh, they're going to need some kind of initial capitalization. 
and they're going to need uh, land. And so the, you know, the bonding and acquisition uh, lines up with financing and, and land. So another question that a lot of people ask is, is, uh, is, this, some, is this going to replace all of these other uh, housing programs? Are you trying to get rid of the low-income housing tax credit? Are you trying to get rid of community development block grants? And um, there's a lot of fear both from folks in the nonprofit sector and uh, from tenants of affordable housing properties that uh, a newfangled program is going to get rid of the housing that they currently live in uh, or threaten it in some way. And I think it's really important to frame um, the social housing approach as making the, making the pie bigger, right? We have, we have a limited constraint pie of uh, a, a constrained subsidy pie from Congress, right? Congress sets the number of low-income housing tax credits every year that the Treasury can give out. Um, Congress sets the amount of community development block grants that go out. Congress sets the amount of uh, emergency solutions grants that go out, and those are limited. What, what the social housing approach aims to do is move beyond those constraints and say, we can finance uh, these mixed income type of properties or for sale properties that can produce housing beyond what those constraints allow. Um, and I think that's really important to frame this as this is not this is not a replace. This is a we are we need so much housing in so many places. We need to we need to expand the pie of what we can build uh, beyond. Um, so on this question of, of what exactly we're asking a public agency to do, um, to get a little bit into the abstract with it, um, you know, I, mean, I think, you know, concretely this first thing, building public option housing that all families are eligible and can afford. This is the very concrete of, we want to build and we want housing that all people are able to afford and that more people are eligible for. Um, with a lot of the programs from Congress, we have a very limited eligibility pool and all of these programs are means tested and there's long wait lines to get into these properties. And a more broad-based universal approach both builds uh, a larger base of support for these types of programs. More people uh, are able to participate in them. Um, um, and it just allows you to, you know, like we were, I was saying earlier, build more. Um, and why is this important? Um, well, providing housing that's affordable to all is uh, important if we believe that housing is a human right and we want to ensure that everybody has access to that housing. Um, but in a little bit more abstract sense, what's really nice about the social housing model is that in the private market, what happens is when there are real estate gains on properties, they go into somebody's pocket and they stay there. And that person maybe will do something socially beneficial with some of them, or maybe they won't. When we have a social housing agency, we can keep any gains that come in and put them to socially beneficial use, meaning recirculate them back into, um, back into the agency to produce even more social housing. Uh, and when we're doing this and we're building in this way, we can also create broader economic stability, not just uh, by making housing more affordable for all of the people that can live in social housing, um, but also by having an influence on the housing construction market, which I'll show a, a couple of slides in a minute here about um, a little bit of research into how that might work uh, if, you know, if jurisdictions in the United States were, were to adopt models like this. So first though, this, this kind of socially beneficial use of the equity, this is a, this is a kind of example um, for rental properties. I know uh, Senator Chang's bill is, is uh, interested in, in you know, a model more like the uh, Singapore approach with owner occupied units. Um, but there's, there's some uh, you know, cross pollination between those ideas, between these you know, socially beneficial uses here. But in, in, a, in a rental approach, um, the idea here is 
if you have a mixed income uh, building where some of the units are rented at higher, you know, rented to folks who are higher income and, and their market rates being paid, and you have a number of the apartments that are rented at lower rents in order to be affordable to people on lower income levels, the cross subsidy between these two, the profits that are made on the market rate units subsidize um, the losses on the cross subsidized units. And so, you know, this, this is a very simplified example where it's just 50-50. Um, obviously, all of the, the levels of affordability, the, the income mix, right? Can you do 50-50 or is it 60-40, 65-35? And the depth of the affordability, how many of these units are affordable to people making 40,000 a year? How many are affordable to make people making 20,000 a year? How many are affordable to people making 80,000 a year? You have, you have all these different levels um, uh, to pull, right? And, and in order to get you a mix that allows you to you know, self-finance these projects and um, get the best uh, social use you know, out of those funds that you can depend. And you know, that all depends on your market, the incomes in your area, all of these different things. Um, so, and you know, obviously this, this approach allows the, the rental model to have long-term financial stability. So you don't need to, you know, with a typical low-income housing tax credit project, every 15 years, you need to pour more capital into the project because the rents aren't enough to pay for those operations and capital expenses. Every 15 years, you're dipping back into the federal bucket to uh, get more funding. With the cross-subsidized approach, you're not doing that. The, you're able to maintain those constant operations just on the cross-subsidy alone. Um, so these economic stability questions, I think, are very interesting and I think are, are good things to bring up to, to folks who have questions about why would we want the public sector to be involved in in housing construction and so this is uh this is a plot there's there's been a quite a bit of research on how tied the housing production cycle is to the general business cycle uh, of the economy our recessions that happen and so you can see here the red line is uh number of homes it was basically number of permits uh, for homes at different points in time. And uh, the blue line is basically showing uh, basically showing the employment rate, uh, one minus the unemployment rate for participants in the labor force. So you can see at all of these points where we have gray bars, uh, where we have recessions or almost all of them, we see housing production plummet right before or right around uh, when we have an economic recession and unemployment uh, jumps up. And this is something that, uh, you know, we, if you look here at the, at the housing financial crisis, um, we see a particularly strong effect. And so let me jump to the next one. Um, here is, uh, one of the results from a study that was done recently looking at uh, two different social housing models, one in Austria and one in Ireland. And so this is these plots. So the, the solid line is uh, uh, changes in home prices uh, for Austria and the dashed line is changes in home prices for Ireland. And so you can obviously see that Austria stayed relatively stable throughout the housing financial crisis. Pretty unique. Uh, the United States absolutely did not. Ireland also did not. Um, there was a, a big drop and then there was a big rise uh, in 2013. And the authors of this study attribute this difference to the fact that in Austria, their social housing sector produces and during the recession continued to produce the same number of units that they were before the recession and after the recession, because uh, 
because these things are publicly financed and, and many of the agencies are, are public sector agencies, they aren't deterred uh, to make investments in housing when there's a downturn. All of the private actors, uh, when there's a downturn, are not interested in taking that risk to produce housing. The public sector obviously is not deterred because it still has a budget. It's still there's still a social need for housing, so it still builds housing, and it's able to, uh, you know, in in doing that, it's able to stabilize home prices in a way that that countries where uh, this kind of universal social housing approach isn't taken aren't able to achieve. And so, you know, obviously this isn't something you know. You're not gonna you're not gonna see this huge effect if you're building you know a thousand units a year or, or you know some small amount like this. This is th these are the kind of effects that you know Austria is able to have these effects because they've been doing this for quite a long time and and have have gotten quite a bit of scale. Um, but you know I think that's that's uh, a lot of folks are interested in pursuing that as as kind of the the long that's the path ahead um, to the United States is to get on a path where we can create more of this kind of economic stability and reduce the volatility of our business cycles. Um, so back to this, what exactly are we asking a public agency to do? Um, we're asking them to become the developer. And you know, in the past, our public housing authorities have um, kind of done this, uh, but typically right now we, you know, we have a very, uh, we farm a lot of operations out um, and we're not able to achieve a lot of the scale that some of the that agencies in other places in the world are able to achieve and we're not able to achieve some of those uh, bigger picture economic benefits. And so what does this work actually look like? Well, I mentioned land acquisition and contracting and bids, but the other big piece of it is, you know, what does a developer do? What is most of the work? underwriting and financing, putting together um, real estate deals. So you have a piece of land, uh, you need to get a, uh, you need to model out what are the um, uh, for sale prices going to be or what are the rents going to be in the property. Um, you need to get your financing and issue bonds or take out loans in order to cover those construction costs. These are all, relatively, I mean, they're, they're, it's complex work, um, but it's, these are all relatively simple operations in the sense that our public sector agencies are already doing this kind of thing all the time. So all of, you know, every low income housing tax credit deal um, that happens in the United States has, uh, there's an underwriter in some public agency who is, who is doing that work. Um, land acquisition, um, maybe a little bit less happens for housing, but almost any city or county government has the ability and has experience doing you know, land acquisition. And then contracting and bids and things like that. Um, I think you know, every public agency in the country has, has done some contracts. Obviously building uh, you know, housing is, is a little bit more complex than maybe your typical contract. Um, and I, you know, we can get into that in the Q&A. That, that's in the, you know, the, the contracting and, and bid stuff I think is actually very interesting. Thing and there's a lot of opportunities for for social housing agencies to to um, do some interesting work to move that to move things forward in that arena um, that I can talk about more. Um, okay, so these questions of how to structure uh, an agency to do this kind of work are really interesting to a lot of folks that I've talked to in, in states across the country. Um, and I think there's kind of two approaches. So there's the existing program approach. Um, this is, and I'll talk about these folks a little bit more, but Montgomery County, Maryland has a kind of what I call proto social housing agency, um, which is, it's basically the, the public housing authority for Montgomery County. Um, but they have now, they've created this new housing production fund that I'll talk about um, that is allowing them basically to build and own uh, mixed income rental properties. So they do like 65% uh, 
market, 35% affordable, and they have some flexibility depending on the depth of the affordability. Um, and, you know, they're building like a 400 unit uh, passive house property um, right now, uh, right next to a bus rapid transit line. So they're, they're doing all this kind of eco district type planning. Um, uh, but basically, you know, the way it happened is there was an existing agency that had all of the authorities that were already needed uh, to do this. And just with a little change, uh, you know, with, with the right people at the agency who were interested in this kind of idea and the right change and the creation of a new funding stream, they were able to actually make it happen. Now, you know, that's obviously contingent on having some people in your agency uh, in an existing agency who want to try this thing and um, you know, having an agency that already has these capabilities, not everybody's gonna have all of those pieces uh, together at the moment that you wanna create something like this. So you also have uh, a kind of do-it-yourself approach. And so um, it's my understanding that that's the way that Senator Chang's bill uh, is kind of designed. And it's also the way that uh, assembly member uh, Alex Lee's bill is designed in California, AB 387. Um, the idea in, in California's bill, which I'm a little bit more familiar with, is to create uh, a, a state agency that basically has all of these authorities um, that I've talked about a bunch already. Um, and, uh, you know, slowly scale it up. And with this, you know, you may get, it, it may be a little bit more politically difficult um, for a legislator to do something like this. You know, big new agencies are scarier um, to folks than um, just giving a new, you know, tweaking some rules and giving a new funding stream to an existing agency. But I think, you know, it looks like assembly member Lee is, is maybe gonna be looking at a, a, a pilot approach um, to getting people on board um, with the California Housing Company or California Housing Authority, with not don't remember which they're calling it. So, but, but I mean, these are these are all these are questions that the answer is going to be different uh, no matter where um, you are. And you know, I mean, it sounds like Hawaii has has. Um, made a choice on that, but it's uh, an interesting uh, question for other folks across the country. Um, so now on to the funding. So there are really three main approaches to uh, funding social housing development. The first one um, that I'll talk about is, is currently what's being used in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is financing construction with municipal bonds. Uh, the second is public sector loans of some kind. Uh, so Singapore's HTB and Finland's ARA, um, these are both, and, and they're slightly different, but they're both structured basically as, as public sector loans um, for the construction costs of housing. And then of course there's, um, and I, I don't have to slide on, on the grants one, but you know, uh, public housing in the past in the United States was mostly uh, funded with grants, although um, there were a few public housing agencies in, in the history of the United States that uh, a lot of the projects were financed with municipal bonds. Um, so there's a sense in which moving back to that bond financing for this kind of mixed income approach or for a for sale approach uh, is kind of a bit of a return to the past in a sense. So the first one I'll go through is municipal bond financing. Uh, and this is a model for rental um, social housing in Maryland. And this is currently in use. They've got basically a thousand units in the pipeline and they've got shovels in the ground on a few of them. So this is, it's very exciting to see this uh, approach kind of coming to life. So the way it works is relatively simple. The county uh, gives, the this housing opportunity commission three million bucks a year nothing you know their budget is their budget is huge this is like 0.001 percent of the budget uh hoc then issues a bond on that revenue so you know the, the idea is three million a year for 20 years 
HRC issues a bond and gets all of that money up front minus interest um, and puts it into this housing production fund uh, here. And then uh, HSC goes out and combines funds from this housing production fund uh, with a conventional mortgage. They just go out and, and get a construction loan. Um, and then they also, they will find a pension fund um, or another small developer who will put in like five or 10% of the equity on the project. And this is basically just to, they do this partly because they're, you know, um, partnering with developers who might not be, uh, you know, have a project they want to do, but um, aren't able to find financing on the market. So this is, uh, you know, this is interesting in, in, the, in the sense of that economic stability that I was talking about earlier. So one of the projects in Montgomery County, Maryland is being built right now. The developer who wanted to build it um, couldn't find financing. They had financing and, and, and the deal fell apart. And so they weren't going to be able to build the project. They went to HOC in Maryland and said, hey, we still want to do, we still want to build this. This is a passive house building. Um, we want to build these units. And HOC said, great, we'll come in. We're going to take the majority ownership stake um, and we're going to structure the deal how we want to structure the deal. But you will be an equity investor and you can get your return. And then after four years, we're gonna fully buy you out. Um, and so that's the approach they take. They, they have a, a small minority investor. And then after a few years, once the building stabilizes, they buy that stake out. Um, and then they slowly return funds into the housing production fund. So it kind of operates on a rolling basis. So I know this is, I, I, I don't know, how familiar everyone with is with with these kind of um, bond and financing approaches, but I'll be happy to go back to this slide and answer questions if, if anyone has them later on. Um, I think we're getting close to the end here. Um, now this is the public loan financing approach. This is also for rental, um, the way things work in Finland. So starting at the bottom here with the state. Um, treasury, the only thing that comes from the national government is interest subsidy. I, I, they guarantee the loans, but they also pay the interest on the loans. The lender for most of these social housing projects in Finland um, is a bank, but it's Munifin, which is a publicly owned bank that's owned by a conglomerate of municipalities across Finland. Um, so. Already they have uh, in Finland some social infrastructure like these kind of conglomerate municipally owned banks that, that we don't have uh, here in the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not gonna stop us. Uh, and then the owner and developer of the properties uh, is social housing companies that are owned by the municipalities. So in Helsinki's case, it's the largest municipality in Finland, they, they actually own a couple of uh, social housing companies, the largest of which is called HECA. Um, and HECA, this company is actually the largest landlord in the entire country of Finland. And it's, it's this social housing agency owned by Helsinki. Um, and then there are also some smaller nonprofit uh, municipally sponsored companies that do, you know, for example, uh, uh, much, you know, very high need housing, formerly homeless housing, addiction treatment housing, these, these different types of things. But the vast majority is just this kind of universal social housing from HECA. Then they have another company that builds specifically for public sector employees. So um, they have a big fabric. Um, um, and, the, and the ARA um, approves the interest subsidies um, and is it, it, the ARA is kind of the go-between uh, between the state treasury and the owner. So that, you know, these, all of these kind of institutions were initially stood up back in the 1970s and now 50 years later, um, Finland obviously has uh, what looks like a, a uh, very organized and clean approach um, where you see how all the funds move and it's, it's very simple and there's, um, you know, it just looks very nice and clean. Um, 
they didn't get there overnight. Um, it was not this nice and clean back in the 1970s. Of course, you, they got there by uh, scaling up their programs and doing them well for a number of years. Um, so that's important. And that is also the case um, for public loan financed housing in Singapore through the HDB, um, which was also stood up in um, 1962, I believe, so even longer ago. Um, so in Singapore, uh, the national government loans at 0% interest to the State Housing Development Board. Um, the HDB builds the housing, and then uh, there is some rental, like a little bit of below market rental housing um, for folks that can't afford to buy, but the vast majority, 80% um, of Singaporeans live in HDB housing and 90% of those households are owner occupants. So the vast majority are these kind of 99 year uh, long-term leaseholds on the property that allow those folks to build equity um, uh, if, you know, when they resell uh, their unit. So what I was talking about earlier with putting uh, equity gains to use in rental housing by cross-subsidizing in the owner-occupant model, that equity uh, is also put to a socially beneficial use by, you know, maintaining these public properties, but allowing resident owner-occupants uh, to also gain some equity uh, for themselves uh, out of that. Um, and, you know, the I didn't put it on for Finland, but both HDB in Singapore and uh, Finland's social housing agencies all have AAA bond ratings from, from most of the rating agencies. So uh, part of that is that the national governments in both cases um, guarantee the debt, which is something that's not quite the case uh, in the United States, but you know, I think it's possible we could get there someday. Um, let's see, I think I have, yeah, just, just two more, I'll go quickly through these so we can do some Q and A. Um, kind of talked about some of this. A lot of people ask what makes this approach a stronger alternative to the kind of current models. In my view, like I talked about, currently we, we have a limit of resources. We have a limited number of all of these different subsidies and grants. Um, subsidies also have sunset dates right? Like you have to recapitalize after every 15 years for low income housing tax credit properties. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of times it's a guarantee that you'll be able to get that a couple of times, but it's not always a guarantee that you'll be able to get those subsidies. Um, and it's also more difficult to realize long-term planning needs when you have every single project is kind of a one-off approach. And obviously, you know, for those, those familiar with LIHTC, you know, your qualified allocation plan can allow you to do some of this long-term planning, um, but not at all in the same way that uh, these highly planned um, communities that are integrated with transit and shopping areas um, and other types of housing and parks and all of these things uh, that you get with the, with the Finnish and Singaporean uh, approach to planning and construction kind of at scale. Um, and actually Montgomery County, Maryland is, is starting to try and move in this kind of direction by aggregating kind of swaths of, of green, uh, green greenfield land um, in order to kind of assemble larger lots to do bigger projects on and, and integrate with, uh, you know, other amenities that, that folks living in housing would like to have. Um, and then the last one on the social housing model is that, you know, retaining that property equity. And so with the for sale approach, you're able to retain that equity uh, and pay back your loan quickly um, and also allow owner occupants to gain equity. And with rental properties, um, you're just paying back your initial bond and you're able to uh, put that equity back uh, into your production fund, recycle it, start over, build some more. Um, and these are some questions that, you know, folks have asked me about, uh, for rental housing, you know, what are the tenants rights, uh, what are the rent levels, what are the rent increase rules, um, how are lease renewals done, how are repairs done, 
uh, democratically, all these different questions. Owner equity rights, um, how much equity growth are owner occupants or long-term leaseholders able to accrue? Um, zoning, uh, if you're creating a social housing authority, do they need to follow um, every single uh, zoning rule that, that currently exists in your jurisdiction or do you give them uh, some ability to uh, uh, exceed or get out of that um, since it's, you know, uh, the intent is to serve a kind of social good. Um, contracting, which, you know, folks have questions, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that. And then the affordability mix uh, questions that we already talked about. So um, that's the bulk of my presentation. I am more than happy to uh, answer any questions or go back to any slides. Um, very curious to hear folks' thoughts and, and what they think and uh, appreciate you all taking the time to listen. Thanks, Paul. Uh, that was a very in-depth presentation and, and thank you so much for, uh, for giving that, all those details to us. Um, I'll give people a minute to uh, put in their questions into the chat or Q&A. Um, but uh, just to start us off, um, I mean, okay, so contracting and bidding, you, you um, have hinted a little bit at the, uh, what you called interesting work that public agencies uh, can do to move this forward. Can you um, maybe just elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um, so one example that I'll give is uh, an agency I'm pretty familiar, I, I live in New York City. So an agency I'm pretty familiar with is the New York City Housing Authority. Um, and while they are, uh, currently, you know, they, they provide mostly Section 9, uh, you know, uh, typical public housing in the United States. They are kind of moving in a path where um, they would like to be able to uh, change some of their contracting rules uh, through a, a couple of different processes, one of which would be creating a, a new housing preservation trust um, at the state level. Um, that they would make eligible for uh, a different funding stream from HUD that they would be able to bond out to do a lot of the repairs that they need to do at their agency. And one of the core things that they are uh, excited about um, if they're able to, to follow through on this is moving, um, moving to a progressive design build contracting process. And so that's a technical term, but basically what it allows is instead of having um, you know, a 12 month RFP and selection process for the designer, and then a 12 month RFP um, and selection process for a general contractor, uh, and then another RFP process for um, any, you know, for different aspects of subcontracting and just adding years uh, in some cases onto the project timeline. The progressive design build um, would basically allow them to do one big process and make all of those uh, selections at once. Um, and then taking that a step further, um, there's a number of folks uh, working in California on um, if they're able to get a, a state level authority, um, trying to set up a, a kind of medium term regional contracting process. Where, oh, sorry, my cat just jumped on my lap. Um, uh, a kind of medium term regional contracting process. So, so you know, instead of doing one different contract uh, for each project, you know, even, even progressive design build, you may do one different contract for each building or, or maybe a couple of buildings. Um, but if you could say, okay, the California housing company would like to do a five year contract for all of the housing that we anticipate building in the um, San Francisco Bay Area over the next five years. Um, there are a number of, uh, you know, um, general contractors uh, who would be very interested in that guaranteed work. And one nice thing about that is, is also that kind of counter cyclical economic benefit of um, that's guaranteed work if there's a recession sometime in those five years, right? Because the the state agency is not going to slow down. Um, and particularly a lot of um, uh, 
uh, building trades unions really like that economic stability of um, knowing that they're going to have have work um, coming up ahead and not having to underbid on on contracts in order to get them and, and all of these uh, kind of incentives that come up in, in in your normal contracting process. So those are two of the ones that I'm um, that I two of the different kind of approaches that I think are, are interesting that, that uh, could be done. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a couple questions about um, financing. So um, is it is it possible to finance rental housing with revenue bonds paid back with future rents? This was an audience question. Yeah, I see that. I'm just going to I'm going to hop back to here. So um, with the Montgomery County Maryland Housing Production Fund, I, I didn't go through every detail on here. I, I'm sorry, I should have done that. So basically, they are doing that. Um, but they have a, a kind of another step in the process. So step one is the county gives that 3 million per year for 20 years. Then Housing Opportunity Commission issues a bond on that revenue. Um, they combine it with funds from, uh, from the H they combine the HPF funds with conventional debt and outside investment. And then what they do, once they, um, once they have constructed the building, they issue another bond on the rents being collected to buy out um, uh, the, the other owner and to buy out the housing production fund debt that initially went in. So basically what they're doing is this, the housing production fund, which is the, you know, it's the very first thing that goes in the very top, um, that's their way to get very, very low cost initial capital. And then once they put that in and actually construct the project, um, they buy that money out, put it back into their fund, um, uh, and they buy it out with a revenue bond on, on the future rents. So yes, that is, it, it is a little bit complicated, but um, uh, it is the, it is the best way to lower those initial capital costs um, at the beginning of the project. And there, you know, it, there's a lot of ability to, to kind of tweak um, these processes to match, uh, you know, local needs may be different. Um, you may, there may be situations where um, if your market rents in a particular area are higher than Montgomery County or lower than Montgomery County, you may want to have a slightly different approach um, to how you're doing that. Great. Um, the, another question on the financing side. Um, you know, you talked about the the public loan financing uh, models from Singapore and um, and Finland, um, and you talked a little bit about how this is sort of um, um, uh, helped by the fact that it is at the nation state, like the sovereign state level. Um, is are there models, or do you think it is possible for any lower um, levels to really do this themselves at the state level or county level, or is it really something only national governments can do? Um, uh, my feeling is that national governments can do it best because um, they have, uh, national governments have greater fiscal space, right? Um, they have access to all kinds of different um, dollars and financial vehicles and instruments uh, to you know make programs like this work um, but you know in general my view on on moving social housing forward kind of over the next five to ten years is there is there's definitely an ability for local jurisdictions and counties uh, and states to stand up these models um, maybe you're not able to achieve you know, really significant scale um, without assistance from the federal government. But, but I think generally, if, if, we, if we have this kind of wave, if, if Hawaii, California, New York, Illinois, Maryland, all stand up agencies like this and are, and are really doing something interesting, um, Congress and, and HUD and, and you know, uh, FHA have no, uh, they'll have to respond and say, oh, these people are solving a problem. Um, you know, and, and then I think the, the approach that you probably want from the federal government is, is 
very similar to, to what happens. Uh, I mean, Singapore and Finland, the national level, basically doing the same thing. Interest rate subsidy in Finland um, and guarantee on the debt. And then uh, in Singapore, rather than an interest rate subsidy, the government itself just provides the loan at 0% interest. So, you know, interest rate subsidy you know, kind of baked into the, to the product. Um, and, and, and that is effectively what has allowed um, uh, Singapore and, and municipalities in Finland to, to do this work at scale and achieve their um, uh, really equitable outcomes um, in terms of uh, provisioning housing uh, to people. But you know, I, I think we get there by, by having local jurisdictions and states stand up agencies and do what they can at the state level. And I think that the, the um, uh, Montgomery County approach of, of municipal bond financing is um, uh, really interesting and, and um, perhaps one of the best ways um, to do that. Although obviously, I mean, if you can, if you can get uh, uh, a large amount of just grant funding from your state government, um, you know, who says no to grants, um, but I, I, I don't think you need it. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, well, talking about moving it forward and, and, you know, I, what you say makes a lot of sense that it's going to, you know, the innovations are going to happen at the local and state level and then sort of, uh, triple up to, to the national level once, once the momentum gets started. So, um, you know, how I, I'm thinking about, you know, if we can talk about how we how we actually do that. And, and some of that is on the social consciousness level of like, you know, this basic idea that uh, public housing should be available to all, you know, you've written that, you know, um, and, and, you know, this is conceived in the Aloha Homes model too, that, you know, it's not just for the lowest income people, it's, for, it's open to people of all income levels. So how do we begin to shift people's mindset around thinking of public housing as something different? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, I I think when I think about this, I think back. I'm always reminded of the the very beginnings of of the public housing programs in the United States, which were actually quite different in in the first couple of years than than they uh, became later on, and, and they are today. Um, you know, today we have a situation where the funding has just been cut and cut and cut and cut and cut and and you you know point to the housing and say oh it's a it's a failure well you know if you don't pay your electric bill and they turn off the lights you know it's like saying oh no electricity doesn't work you know electricity is a hoax it's like no it didn't fund it but uh, you know one of the reasons that um, it was easy for politicians to defund uh, those programs is because there was not a kind of broad universal constituency for it. It was a very stigmatized program. Um, and historically, initially, the reason why that happened is that uh, the first few public housing developments in 1934, 35, 36, uh, and part of 1937, um, and, the, and these projects were in Chicago, New York, Atlanta, um, they were not means tested. So they were just moderate rent uh, apartments available. Uh, and some of them were racially segregated, which obviously we want to fight against today uh, and you know, try to create integrated communities. Um, but uh, they were universally available in terms of income. And uh, the um, private industry did not like that because if the public sector is providing um, some housing like this uh, at moderate rent, that, that pushes down um, on those market pressures that are causing rents to rise. And that reduces the, uh, the level of rents and, and the economic gains that the private uh, real estate industry is able to kind of extract from changing land values and all of these different economic conditions. Um, and so when the National Housing Act in 1937 was passed, uh, it was set into law that the public housing could only be for the very lowest income people and that it had to be tied geographically to slum clearance areas. 
basically because um, the real estate industry said, you can build housing for these people. I wasn't going to build housing for them anyway. You're not doing anything to my market share. Um, and so that's how we, you know, I, and I think that pointing out that history is, is, is actually really important um, and, and paints this picture of, of um, the conditions that allowed our public housing to fall into this disrepair and, and kind of points to an approach of what could we do differently to build a, a broader base. Um, and that's, um, you know, having municipalities, counties, states, um, engage in this kind of universal housing production model uh, that pushes back on, I mean, it, it pushes back on all of it. It pushes back on, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, extractive parts of the real estate market. Uh, it pushes back on the segregation um, of housing and, you know, uh, both, both in public housing and in, in private market housing. Um, you know, I, I think that story is a really good one to push back on it. Yeah, well, I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's well, that's that's interesting to consider. And some of it is just going back to the way, you know, it was originally conceived. Some of it is pushing back against the narratives that uh, um, entrenched interests, you know, have, have yeah. been promoting. Uh, you know, I think in Hawaii, our situation is is interesting because there definitely is a huge awareness around the housing crisis. You know, our, our median home price here is is around a million dollars, and of yeah. course, um, our incomes are not nearly enough to make up for it. Um, but there is a lot of tension, I think, in Hawaii specifically around simply building more, um, because the conversation is really wrapped up in these interconnected issues of. Uh, and, and concerns about colonialism, you know, displacement, sure. gentrification, impact to the natural environment. So, so I know you're not an expert in, in our specific state case, but, you know, do you have any suggestions for, you know, thinking about um, bringing those issues into the fold, um, you know, and moving the conversation yeah. forward? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, um, an interesting question. You know, I, I, I think one thing that, that, um, is really helpful about the social housing approach for those questions is because you have um, this public sector involvement, right, which is um, naturally more democratic than, than private market involvement, you can create institutions within, um, within your agency or, or um, within your you know, buildings, your properties to allow for more democratic involvement um, in uh, certain parts of the process, you know, in terms of, so like in, in Finland, everyone who lives in um, HECA housing uh, and, and most of the social housing agencies is a member of a, a tenant union. Um, and what they do is they, you know, will have meetings and, and determine things about what repairs they want to prioritize, um, um, what upgrades they want to prioritize, um, you know, and they'll have a, a portion of the kind of operating funds uh, as a budget for, for, you know, the organization to do various things that they would like to do in the housing. And, and that's something that, you know, I mean, maybe you get that in a, in a private co-op building um, if you have uh, uh, enough money to, uh, buy in one of these, you know, very nice co-op buildings where you, where you have these kind of cooperative management things. Um, but that's typically not the case in, in most rental housing in the United States today. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's something that, I mean, that's something that, that is just so different from what, what you get today that, um, you know, gives people opportunities to take back control of their housing um, in a way that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Um, so that's one, I mean, you know, the issues of, of gentrification and, and colonialism, um, you know, I think if you, you know, I, I think it's a similar thing with, with the public sector involvement and there's, you know, some kind of, you know, there's democratic support for doing this kind of thing. Um, it's very different from a private sector developer coming in and um, 
building something and, and the profit going into their pocket, whereas in this case, it's going back into the public's pocket. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of people who are um, displaced or hurt by gentrification are, you know, kind of double hurt by the fact that somebody's making a big buck on it. If you have um, new housing going up that is that is for the public and everyone's able to, it's universally available um, and it's benefiting everyone, I think you, you can kind of change the landscape on what is development, you know. Development now is something that the private market just doesn't makes a lot of money on, and and you know building housing is is sorely needed. Um, so of course people are going to make money on it, but if it's the public sector doing it, it's it kind of changes that narrative. Development then becomes a a socially beneficial thing that we're doing together to help ourselves out of a hole. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I wanted to get to one more audience question. Um, Maui has plenty of empty strip malls and apartments that are zoned A1 or A2, uh, but currently in the short-term rental pool, rather than expanding the urban footprint or using public park land, what are ways we can turn these hardened areas into long-term slash affordable housing? Um, just read it. Okay, strip malls. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think this kind of comes back to uh, uh, let me go back to this. Um, I mean, part of this is maybe you know land acquisition, right? Like if you want a if you want to stand up an agency who can do this kind of work, you need to give it the ability to um, you know buy some land and and do these projects. And maybe that land is um, an abandoned strip mall. Um, with you know a little one-story building and a and a big parking lot, uh, and what you want to do do is build a you know a mixed-use property on top of that where you can put that retail back in and put um, a bunch of residents living above it um, to shop at that retail. Um, but I think another part and you know the other part of this question was um, uh, short-term rental pool um, rather than using parkland. Yeah, I mean. Um, another thing that you can do, like, you can obviously build a lot of housing and that is, is one thing that sorely needs to be done almost everywhere in this country. Uh, but you can also buy existing housing um, that is on the private market um, and convert it to this kind of mixed income social housing model. Um, and you can do that either with the, you know, rental or um, convert it to, to ownership. Um, and I think there's cases to be made for, for doing both. I think both are needed, but, um, when you're doing that, obviously you're not adding to the rental stock that, or the, the housing stock that needs to be added to, but you are preserving this housing, um, as, as permanently affordable. Um, and, uh, your total development cost is going to be much lower. So like if you have a limited supply of funding, um, you know, Say you have you have enough funding to do ten new construction deals, um, or maybe you could do eight new construction deals and five acquisition rehab deals. Like you can, you know, you can find the right mix uh, of doing both acquisition rehab and and new construction, um, and especially in places where there's a lot of existing housing that that needs to be recapitalized. Um, that may make sense. Great. Thanks. Well, I know we're coming up to our time. So um, just to close this out, is there, is there any one sort of key takeaway that you like to leave our audience with? Um, that, uh, that I think we can do this and I think we can win and I think we can uh, make housing a human right in the United States. And I think that the social housing approach is the way to do it. Um, you know, as far as you know, big questions. I think I think just just holding on to the model, look, looking at the really successful models, and and there's a there's always um, there's always a lot of kind of urge to deviate a little bit, but but we see some we see some countries that have some of the most successful outcomes in housing, and they're using very similar models. Um, and I think it's important to try to learn from our peers across the world and kind of drive toward similar approaches 
Um, obviously, we have all differences across our cities and states and in our country. Um, but I think the model is a, a good North Star. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, learning from you in presentations like this is a great way for us to keep it moving forward. So we really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you again to our guest today, Paul Williams. You can follow him on Twitter um, at pwilliams underscore. Uh, and he also has a newsletter on Substack, the Social Housing Chronicle, uh, which you can read at housingchronicle.substack.com. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.